morning. Well, we are excited you're here this morning. We are glad that God has brought you. Um, I don't know, I know some of us, not Rob, we're very excited about some snow that, that God gave us the other night because that was an answer to prayer for a lot of people just to at least get to see some snowflakes. I mean, anybody? Just me? Yes, okay. I know I saw that Philip was playing in the snow as well, so I'm glad I was not alone as an adult playing in the snow. Um, <laughs> it was lots of fun, and I'm, I'm really grateful. So many things, so, so many things that we can be grateful for and we can worship God for. Um, most of all, just <laughs> the, very, the very one thing that we get to do this morning, just come and freely praise him. Like that is something we are really, really grateful that we are able to do here in the States. This has been something that we have seen from our brothers and sisters overseas. Pastor Kevin has been keeping you updated with our brothers and sisters in Myanmar that have been unable to meet for over a year. Um, and so this is a huge praise just for us to be here. So let's stand together. Let's worship. This first song is going to be singing all about asking God to build his kingdom here, to bring it here and um, to make it, make it established um, through his people. And so uh, let's just sing this out and, and worship together this morning.
just one word you calm the storm that surrounds me just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch i feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do just one word you hear what's broken inside me just one word and you revive every dream just one time
that one more time. Just our voices. See how marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's continue just to exalt him as we pray. Lord, you are incredible and wonderful, faithful and patient with us. Your mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Lord, we recognize that we have no claim on you because of our good deeds or because of our right intentions. God, we, we recognize in this place that it's only the mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that allows us to come boldly before your throne. So we do so, Father. We do so, Abba, Father, loving Father, who we come to and we seek for mercy and grace in this time of need. Meet with us, we ask. We ask that the word of God would wash over our souls, cleanse us, make us righteous in Christ Jesus, not just positionally, but now practically in our lives. We ask also, Lord, that you would bring conviction of sin, bring joy in victory, bring hope for the future, bring salvation to the lost. Lord, do these things which can only be accomplished by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you can be seated. So good to see you this morning and uh, see that we did survive that good solid half inch of ice. All right. If you're, if you're headed to Children's Church, you can do so at the back. And uh, Hannah's going to be teaching you today, and we'll be praying for uh, you as you learn the Word of God, and we're excited for you to do just that. Well, many of you have, um, many of you have had that experience of having to come in the presence of someone uh, that, uh, that might have your future in their hands. I'm speaking of this thing called an interview. Maybe you interviewed for a scholarship if you went into college or went to grad school, or maybe it was your first job at the filling station or at a restaurant or uh, at some retail place. Maybe you went for an internship, or maybe this is your first time big person job, but you went in for a job interview. Some of you have been on one side of the desk, and at other times in your life, perhaps you've been on the other side of the desk either asking or answering questions. But you, you know what an interview is for, right? The interviewer is seeking to ascertain whether you not only have proficiency and capability, but also whether you have some degree of trustworthiness. In other words, they could probably see on paper, if you have the training and, and, and the experience, they can, they can notice that by looking at your resume or your application, but whether or not you're the kind of person that someone would want to partner with or whether you're the, part, the kind of person that could be trusted with the task or with the resources or with the time, that's the question that brings or those are the reasons that bring someone in for an interview. So the goal of an interview is to gauge or get a feel for the person to see whether they're qualified, again, not just intellectually or with regard to proficiency, but what kind of person are you at the core? Well, that might not be entirely uh, easy to do, and, and a lot of people get it wrong, and I'm sure we're all uh, fallible in terms of trying to see about someone and look deeply into a person's heart, but it is the goal to try to see what kind of person. Well, Paul's getting at something like this in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. What he's trying to do is to say there are a number of teachers and people that you could listen to and regard what they say as true or not true. And what he's trying to do is to demonstrate that Paul has been faithful, along with his colleagues, Timothy and Silas, who are now being sent up to them to proclaim the truth to them, that they are, have been faithful. And he wants to demonstrate that it's more than just what you say alone, though that's part of it. It has to do with the kind of person you are as to whether you're trustworthy with this gospel message. So with that being in mind, let me just review for just a moment. You might remember 
that there were a lot of traveling teachers during the day. And the reason that's important to note is because it really serves as the backdrop upon which Paul is painting this picture for these Thessalonian believers. He wants these believers to be discerning that when people come, you don't just listen to everyone claiming the truth, right? I mean, it's kind of like this. You, you've heard this before, like, well, I know it's got to be true. It was on the internet, right? <laughs> like, you know, well, you, you know, of course, that's facetious and sarcastic. Not everything you read can be relied upon. And, of course, that's true with papers or any other sort of print media, but it's also true with what you hear on TV. And it's also true with what you hear from pulpits and from books that might seem like they are biblically sound. We've got to be people like those in the New Testament who studied the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so or true. In other words, no genuine preacher or proclaimer of the gospel is ever really threatened if they are encouraged to make sure that what they are saying is biblical. Like, demonstrate that this is faithful and consistent with the message of Christ. That, that should be the goal and the desire of any minister of the gospel. And the people of God are those who hold those ministers accountable to the truth of the word of God, right? We should be such a people. So with that in mind, Paul is wanting to equip or empower these Thessalonians so that when they hear something that's deviant from the truth, something that goes off message or off scripture, they'll know something within them will will alert them, their understanding, their faithfulness to the gospel message, their observation on these teachers will allow them to see whether these things are true. This is important because Paul had to leave prematurely. He, had, he left after three Sundays, or three Sabbaths rather, of preaching and teaching Christ to them, and then this great riot arose, and he had to go south. He was going to send Timothy and Silas. In fact, later on in this chapter, you're going to read that. Uh, but, but before they do that, he wants to make sure that along with this letter, they understand there are some ways of distinguishing the true from the false. We looked at two of those last week. Let's look at the remainder, uh, remaining of these two um, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. So the first, just by way of review, the first distinguishing mark was the diligence of the gospel worker. We saw that in verse 9, the first part. Paul says, hey, there are some, this is kind of the background because they knew this. We, we have to fill it in because it's not here in scripture, but the history and the rest of the first, uh, first and second Thessalonians bear this out. There were some traveling teachers who would come, speak, take their pay, and leave with no real diligence, with not, no real investment. Paul says, we work day and night among you, making sure uh, that you, we were able to preach the word of God, which leads to the second distinguishing mark, which was the message. The message of the gospel worker distinguishes him from uh, someone who's a false teacher or someone who's not. And let me say an additional word that I really wanted to get into, but I was focused on the gospel of God, which is the good news that the kingdom has come, and Christ Jesus, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave are the entry point into that kingdom. That's how we get into the kingdom of God, how we become his sons and daughters. But there's a larger picture here, which I think is important, and that is that the message of preaching needs to be Christocentric, that is to say, Jesus Christ needs to be at the center of the message, and the message has to be biblically faithful. So let me just say a word about this. Paul is writing, and he wants to make sure that these believers understand you can't just say anything, and if it sounds good, it's acceptable. It's got to be faithful and consistent with the Word of God, which is why whenever Paul preached and he taught, he worked off of the basis of the Old Testament. That was the only completed portion of the Word of God at the time. Letters were being written, gospels would be written, but as the churches were established, what he said was consistent. And so every time he taught, he would bring out examples from the Old Testament. And this is the model for the New Testament church, is that when we teach, it has to be biblically centered, and it has to be based on the Word of God. There are a lot of churches today, and I'm not seeking to sim simply distinguish us for that alone, but there are a lot of churches today that are big on experience and little on the Word of God. And I'm, I'm not saying that they don't believe the Word of God. I, I think you'd have to be a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not saying that they're untrue and unfaithful to the message of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying you, you get into some real danger zone when you overemphasize experience and underemphasize the Word of God. The Word of God, are that's like the guide rails that keep us in the lane of faithful biblical 
teaching, and preaching. So the Word of God has always got to be front and center in the church. And when it's not, it's a dangerous and potentially dangerous thing. The preaching of the Word of God is a sacred task. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, help me out, finish this up, and hearing by the Word of God. And you know that. You know to complete that because you've been in the Word of God, right? Like, but, but how would we know where faith came if we didn't have the preaching and you weren't involved in Bible study yourself? Believers grow when the message of Christ is preached. And really for the pastor or whoever the proclaimer, the evangelist, or whoever the messenger is, it's a matter of faith for them. Because here's the question for a preacher or a proclaimer of the Word of God. Do I believe that the Word of God has the power to change lives? Or do I believe that my, uh, my antics or my, or my smooth speaking or my oratory skills or my charisma or, or, my, or my experiences have some way of changing? But the Bible makes it clear that the conversion of the soul only happens and the transformation of the believer through the word of God. So the pastor, the proclaimer, the Sunday school teacher, the Wednesday night Bible study teacher, whatever application you're teaching has to be faithful to the word of God and trust. The, you ever heard this phrase, trust the process? <laughs> you got to trust that, that the word of God does not return void. That when you send it out, it, return, it goes and it returns and accomplishes that for which God sent it forth to do. And you got to believe that that's true in your own personal life. Let me extrapolate just a little more and then we'll get back into the text. You got to believe that when you're not feeling anything in your relationship with the Lord. You got to believe that the steady consuming of the diet of the word of God in your life over weeks and months and years, reading when you're not feeling it, <laughs> studying when, when you just maybe in those moments, that over time God has a way of using his word to deeply plant and root, uh, root in your life uh, deep and true faith. And that he's going to use his word consistently when you don't know what to do, when you don't know where to go, when you don't know to whom you should turn. That being in the word of God, long periods over time, has a work in you, even when you don't know it's working. Because the word of God, Hebrews 4, 12 says, is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces to, to even down deep into the dividing of the soul between the joints and the marrows there. In other words, it gets deep down in there where human instrumentation cannot. This is what God's word does. And that's why we trust and proclaim the word of God. And that's why, as tedious as some weeks and some days it may seem, we try to go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. Sometimes we, we maybe focus on another passage and don't get through that whole book. But by and large, that's the steady diet because we believe that this faithful proclamation of God's word over a long period of time, systematically has its effect in us in ways we can't see, but believe by faith that God will do it. All that to be said is that this message has got to be biblical, and it really does distinguish. When you hear someone preaching and teaching a whole lot about self-improvement and a whole lot about life improvement and a whole lot about that to the neglect of the saving and transforming work of God, of Jesus Christ. When you hear a message that focuses on human effort in, in an imbalanced way to the neglect of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the effectual work of his Holy Spirit in your life, be on guard. Again, let me just pause because th there are some who are so uncritical that they swallow everything and so critical that they dismiss everything and it's, you know, it's the, it's the frozen chosen. It's the few you know, the few, the proud, and it's us. We're the only true one. Like, we got to be careful not to, not to dismiss everyone because we don't agree on every point. That, that, that's not faithful and consistent. But again, when you start seeing these imbalances away from grace and toward human behavior, away from Christ and toward human accomplishment, away from the, the, the message of the Word of God and more based on my experience, be aware. And let me tell you one final thing. This is all off script, but I think it's important. One final thing on the note of the message of this. There are a lot of, of churches now that are so fundamentally fixated and focused on creating an experience. I mentioned this to begin with, but let me amplify for a moment. That they are actually now doing things that are contrary to what the Word of God says. Where the Word of God says things should be done decently and in order. 
there's all kinds of chaos and madness. And I, <clears throat> I could call out some of those practices, but I think you're pretty discerning to be able to see that, that, that things not mentioned in Scripture, um, things that seem to defy uh, the attention of Christ and put it on, we've got to be very, very careful. So if you see someone claiming to have an experience or a dream or a vision, and it's contrary to what God's revealed in his word of God. You can know that person is not speaking the truth. Are you with me? Because the word of God is the basis and the foundation. All right. All of that brings us now to the third of these, uh, of these distinguishing marks from false teachers as opposed to gospel workers. So third, the character of the genuine gospel worker distinguishes them from counterfeits. So it's, just, it's not just what you say with your lips. It's what you say with your lives. Right? It's not just... What you proclaim, but it's what you're practicing. We've heard that phrase, right? Practice what you preach. Yeah. In other words, we all know it's one thing to say something. It's another thing to live it out. And one of the, one of the things that can distinguish a false teacher from a true teacher is, are they just saying right things when they're speaking, but they're not really living them themselves? So the character is of great importance. So look at verse 10. He says this. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless, three adjectives there, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. So Paul calls uh, the Thessalonian believers themselves to serve as a witness. I want, I want, I want you all, because we know Paul was from the South, right? I want, I want you all to, to, to bear witness of that what I'm saying is true. Like, if, if so, if not... You can, you can call me on it because you lived out these days as we lived these days out among you. You saw. All right, so he says, and it's a twofold witness. You and God also are our witnesses. Now, that's pretty sobering when you think about it. Like, I'm, I'm calling God to account for my life, that what I'm saying is true. I've lived a holy life in front of you. That's pretty sobering. I don't know how many of us want to invoke the name of God to come alongside us as a witness in the court of truth. To say, I've lived a holy, blameless life among you. That's what Paul's doing here. Holy, blameless, and righteous. This first word, holy, there are two or three words in the Greek language that could be translated holy. Um, the word most commonly used for holy is not used here. This word specifically means to be devoted or entirely dedicated to. It does have to do with ethical behavior, meaning you're doing the right thing and not the wrong thing but it speaks more to the dedication of one's heart, the purity which comes out of a reverence. Uh, it means to be fully yielded to the Lord or devoted to him. Um, this past week and a half or about a week and a half ago, uh, Abby, our 15-year-old, got her driver's permit. Let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> um, she got her driver's permit, and uh, shortly after, I might say, uh, parenthetically, I... I took her into a parking lot and uh, said, all right, drive. And we have this big suburban because, you know, we've got a big family. And so that thing's like a tank, you know. You, it's like a vest. You're like, here we come. We're coming through, you know, pulling down on the, on the trunk, truck horn. But anyway, she got in that thing and she drove really well. I was like, at first I was like, you know, you're always nervous. Like, I'm trusting my life to a 15-year-old, you know. Who thought of this law that says 15-year-olds can drive? But I got, in that, I got in there, and I got on the passenger side with no control, no brake pedal on the right, you know. No, and she did wonderfully. I mean, she, she's just a natural. I said, all right, let's try reverse, you know. And she, she backed up almost perfectly straight. I thought, man, I, this, is, this is remarkable. Way better than I was, I'll admit. Um, don't tell her that because, uh, you know, but, but way better. Anyway, she, uh, but be before we did that, she had to take her permit test, and she was reviewing some of the questions on her phone before she went to the computer to take the test to see if she had enough understanding of what to do to get out on the road. She said, so what does it mean to yield? I was like, oh boy, you know, this is before I saw her drive and she actually did pretty good. But the, I said, oh boy, she doesn't know what it means to yield. I'm like, okay, so it's that triangular sign, you know, red and, and white, and it says yield on it. It means to give the right of way to someone else. It means someone else has the right to move along the way when <laughs> I'm preaching even when I'm not preaching. I just can't help it, you know. It's just, it's just what you do when you're a dad and you're a pastor at the same time. Anyway, like, it's like when you yield the right of way to someone else so they have the right to go but you don't. And if there's no one in the way, then you can go, right? That's what it means to yield. Well, think about that application in our relationships with God. 
To be devoted or to be holy is to yield the right of way and say, okay, God, you have all rights to me. And that, that's not easy to do. Can we be honest? We're, we're okay with that until God violates what we perceive our right to a certain way of living or certain way of life is. Like, I'm okay to yield the right of way or to be fully devoted and dedicated to you, God, until that runs up and against and flies in the face of what I want to happen, right? So, but a holiness, which stems out of a dedication to the Lord, has at the core a yieldedness to the Lord. And then he uses the word not just holy, but he uses the word righteous, which has to do with living right before others. It's almost a term which is used first, not of righteous living like always doing the right things in the eyes of God, though obviously it has those implications, but it has more the idea of justice. Remember in Micah 6, 8, he's shown you, O man, what to do and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So he's shown you what to do, righteous living, and it means to do right by others. It means to live in a way that you, you, have, you have done uh, equitably among your fellow neighbor. You have not treated them unjustly. You've not cheated them out of something. You've not berated them or uh, maligned their character or ruined their reputation. It has to do with the way we live before others. So the first one has to do with a devotion uh, in our relationship with God. The second description of this character means we treated each other in the right way and we didn't do them unjustly. And that was important for Paul. Paul was a businessman. There, there, was, there, there are a lot of ways when you're working with finances and when you're making exchanges that you can do wrong by someone, right? That you can cut corners, that you can not be fully honest, that you can not reveal all, all disclosures. And Paul is doing this in such a way, he's saying, we were righteous before you. Then he uses the word blameless. <clears throat> the word blameless means uh, unable for an accusation to stick. It doesn't mean that people won't blame you. Because we live in a broken, fallen world, right? We, we know that injustices are done and people do say things that aren't true. But what it means is that when people speak against you so as to malign your character, that's not really going to end up to be very believable before people because they've seen the way you've lived. And like Daniel, who alone could be accused for being devoted to God, they might not be able to find something in your life, in your character, that would, that would somehow bring you down. The idea is that that would not pass the test. On close examination, um, they see that you are yielded to the Lord. Treat others rightly. So he's speaking about conversations that we have, the way we treat others, the choices we make, the temptations we turn from, the sin we repent from, the motivations we act out of. All of these things have to do. He's speaking about his character. So take just a a moment, if you will, and pause and reflect on your own life. Could it be said that the message of Christ can be faithfully dispatched through you because your character is consistent with the content of your message? I know it's a sobering thing, right? It, it's a sobering thing to actually have to deliver a message that talks about character when, when you know that you're not perfect. So we're not talking about raising up every accusation that, of every sin that you've had in your past, those things which are forgiven and under the blood of Jesus Christ, whom God has sent you know, those offenses as far as the east is from the west, whom Christ has absorbed upon the cross and, and the handwriting that was against you has been blotted out. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just current living. Are you living a, a life of holiness before others? And indeed, this certainly should be the... Uh, a distinguishing mark of any messenger of the gospel, and we should not accept anything but this. Of course, there's room for grace and forgiveness, but there's also great accountability when it comes, and great responsibility when it comes to proclaiming the gospel truth. There's no doubt that we can run the danger of over-examinizing and over-scrutinizing until no one would be acceptable to bring the message, but we're not talking about that. The danger is often times turning a blind eye to major character issues, and we should be careful. A, a watching world, can we just be very practical about this? A watching world is looking on, and they will never believe the message if, if it's not consistent. Not perfect. We're not talking about perfect, because we know Christ alone is, and he is perfecting us over time, and we'll ultimately do that when we reach glory. 
but there's got to be some consistency in there for the message to be believable, right? I mean, wouldn't you hold someone else to that same standard? If they're like, you know, I believe this, and, and then, but they're living something differently. You're like, I don't think you really do believe that. Maybe it's not really worth being believed in, and I think that standard should be applied to us. All right, not only the character, but, but finally, fourthly, the actions of the gospel worker. Distinguish them from uh, being genuine or being counterfeit. The actions of a gospel worker. In other words, what do they do? Um, not just how do they live in terms of their character, but I want you to see how relationally they interacted with these believers. And that's a pretty big distinction from those who were not faithful to the gospel message and, and were not um, genuinely from God. All right, verses 11 and 12 lay these things out for us. And I think we can go kind of in rapid fire succession. So buckle your seatbelts. We're about to accelerate. Here we go. All right, verse 11. So he's, again, verse 10, you are witnesses that we lived among you in a way that was blameless, holy. <clears throat> for you know, verse 11 now, for you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you, underline exhorted if, you're, if you like to underline, if you actually have a physical Bible in front of you, um, you can underline that, highlight that. Uh, we exhorted each one of you, so I'm just going to highlight these verbs here. We exhorted each one of you, we encouraged you, there's the second one, and we charged you, there's the third one, uh, to walk, we charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Some really good nuggets there. We're about to get into them. So what were the actions of Paul? What did Paul and, and Timothy and Silas do while they were among them? Well, the first thing, they exhorted. Ver, verse, uh, verse 11 says, you know how like a father. Now remember in the previous verses, he says, we were like a child in terms of gentleness and innocence among you. And then he says we were like a nursing mother in how we, we nurtured you. And now he changes the image a third time and says we were like a gentle father. Now, let me pause because there's like probably a really obvious thing that some of you are thinking right now. And we've got to get it out in the open. Some of you didn't have gentle fathers. Some of you had harsh, angry, hard-nosed fathers. And this is a little bit of a stretch for you to imagine. A nurturing gentle father who comes alongside the the son or the daughter and leads them in the right way as opposed to the yelling screaming getting in the face or abusive kind of behavior if you had those experiences growing up and, and that was your reality or maybe the reality was you didn't have someone who was present either physically or emotionally whatever the case was um, I, I want you to imagine and I think you can do this come out of yourselves a little bit and imagine seeing someone who really is a good father and admiring that and longing for that. In fact, the idea that you have, that if you didn't have that experience with a good father who is gentle and gracious among you, you know that that's not right intuitively. Something within you knew that that absence was, was a bad thing because you actually did see that in some other people or at least some observable behaviors that you wanted to be true in your experience. So with that in mind, if you can somehow take yourself out of that, just see how Paul says he was among them uh, and see how it should be for those who minister in the word of God and minister among God's people and really how it should be for all of us in the way we treat each other, especially for those who are in our care. All right. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you. We'll come back to that word exhorted for just a moment. But the idea here is Paul didn't crack the whip and demand obedience. He didn't strong arm them into compliance. A good and a godly father comes alongside his child and urges his children towards obedience. And Paul demonstrates that this is a mark of a genuine gospel worker. This is the mark of someone who really does has experienced the love of Christ and has God as their father, they lead out as a father. <clears throat> Each Notice the individual care. We think of Paul speaking to the masses. We think of him standing in front of uh, the Areopagus or standing on Mars Hill preaching or in, in Athens or, or maybe in a synagogue proclaiming with a big audience. But look at the individual word here. It shocked me when I, when I read it. Again, verse 11. He says, you know how like a, a father... With his children, we exhorted each one of you. Seems clear from this passage that more than just an outward audience with big crowds, that Paul took individual care to meet throughout the week with people, to get with people, to bring them along, to encourage them in their faith. There seems to be a, 
a call here to do the right thing among God's people that Paul is issuing. This word, um, this word exhort, let me give you a definition for that. It means to call or to urge to do the right thing. It actually comes from the same Greek word um, paraclete, which means to come alongside. In John chapter 17, the word parakleo in, in Greek is used of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm going to send to you another. We call, it's translated a helper or uh, one who will come alongside. Same word here. Paul's not likening himself to the Holy Spirit or in any way trying to make himself divine. But what he is saying is there is an action that we all can take that, that cooperates with the work of God himself in coming alongside other people. Listen, I'm going to tell you what. People are craving, craving deeply in their soul someone to come alongside them, put their arm around, I'm talking about believers, put their arm around them and encourage them toward the right way. You can't, you can't even imagine how isolated and alone so many believers feel. They're waiting, they're wishing, they're longing for someone to come alongside. Paul says that we did that for you. We were that for you. Like a loving father who doesn't come behind like prodding or poking or whipping, who isn't coming from in front, yanking and pulling as, as with, from a rope somewhere where the child doesn't want to go. But we came along, it's literally what the word exhort means. We came alongside of you and called you to the right action. Uh, what a great example of parenting and what a great challenge for any of us who are parents or grandparents uh, to, to follow through with that behavior. Here's the second word. He used exhort. Secondly, in these actions that distinguished him from, from others, he used the word encourage. This word typically or more, uh, more literally means speaking next to someone. It, it's almost a, in fact, the Greek words have such great etymological similarity that, that they're almost used interchangeably. But this is slightly nuanced so as to say when someone's in trouble, you help them uh, find their way. In, in this way, we think of this word, <coughs> excuse me, we think of this word encouragement as someone who is weary and needs their arms lifted up. Someone who is dejected and needs their head lifted up. Someone who has stumbled and needs their body lifted up. Here's the idea. You're lifting someone up. The faint-hearted, the weary, the discouraged. When someone doesn't have the strength to press on, you come alongside them and you bring to them a word of encouragement. And, and <clears throat> not just words like, you know, it's all going to get better or this too shall pass. <laughs> Flippant little phrases that we come up with that, we don't know really what else to say, but coming along with the word of God, giving them, giving them biblical counsel. You know, I think, and I'll be honest with you, this is true for me even as a pastor of some 30 years now in the ministry. Uh, I think sometimes we're afraid to use the word of God because we don't want to be that person who comes like Bill, da like, like, uh, like these three friends of Job. I just started reading in the book of Job. I, Jeanette's on the reading plan. Several others of you are on that reading plan. Every time I open up the, word, the book of Job, I'm like, okay, Lord, what disasters are about to come in my life? You know, like the superstitious sort of ridiculous idea that just because I'm reading the book of Job, difficulties are going to come. I mean, they come anyway, right, whether you're reading the book of Job or not. But uh, his friends, he had three of them that came along with him, and, and, and they all offered him you know, sometimes it sounded just like it was good enough advice, but really they, they were just throwing things at him. Sometimes we're like that with the Word of God. We're afraid to use it because we don't want to be like these people. But let me tell you, it's the Word of God that actually has eternal value. And so not using it to beat someone over the head, you know, you know and, and, and tell them you're not doing it, but, but using it as a source of encouragement. And there may come a time, as we're going to see in this third verb, to use this as, a, as the Word of God as a, in a corrective way, but we can use the Word of God to encourage. How many times have you, have, have you done what, what we might call Bible roulette? I mean, I'm not advising this, but you're like, Lord, I need some encouragement from you, and you're like, and you point to a verse, you know? You know, just kind of, oh, I hope that's my, oh, that was a bad one, not that one, Lord. Best two out of three. Let, you know, let's go. You know, like we, a dangerous way to read God's Word. I don't recommend that at all, but basically we, evidence that we want the word of God to encourage us. We need that for each other. Paul says, we were like that for you. We came alongside you. We, we, we not only encouraged you, exhorted you, urged you to do the right thing, but, but encouraged you when we were weak. 
believers being in each other's life. Some of you, I could just, I'm not going to do it because it would embarrass you, but you do this so well. You were so good at calling people, at texting, uh, checking on others, saying, hey, I'm just checking on you. I want to see how you're doing. You okay? Do you need anything? You're just encouraging. You got the gift. That is one of the spiritual gifts mentioned in the New Testament, the gift of encouragement. But whether or not that's something you've been supernaturally gifted with, it's, it's a commandment for all of us to do, and certainly modeled here in this passage. The third verb mentioned in verse 11 um, is this, or verse 12 rather, is this word urging. Um, I think your translations probably say charged, as mine does. The ESV says, we charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. <clears throat> this word means to bear solemn witness to something. So Paul's saying, listen, I can bear witness that this is true, that, that we are to walk in this manner or in this way. Um, we might use the word urge because we understand that a little more than the word charge, but it means to testify on behalf of God's word that it is true and then encourage someone to come alongside and live in a way consistent with that. So he does that. He says, I urge you or I charge you to walk in a manner worthy of him. The word walk is started in the Old Testament as a picture of how believers in the true and living God should live their lives. So the idea of walk is, um, <clears throat> is how you conduct your life, how you interact with others, the choices you make, the way you speak. In Psalm 1, we read, blessed is the man who does not walk in the wisdom or the counsel of the ungodly. Walking, the manner of life, how you choose to live. We talk about that today, right? The Christian walk, the Christian life, how to walk. Well, the Bible says, and clearly hear from Paul, that our lives, like a journey as we're traveling closer and closer to the Lord, ought to be consistent with the word of God. So Paul's saying, I'm adjuring you to act and live and conduct yourself in a manner worthy of your calling. That The idea of in the manner worthy of your calling or in manner worthy of the one who calls you means consistent with. It doesn't mean perfection. It doesn't mean that we are unable, that, that we are going to walk uh, absolutely every time the right way, but it means we're we're going in the same direction as God's word. We're not going in the opposite way. Paul uses this in Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, he uses the same kind of language. Listen to this. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. How about Philippians 1, 27, just to kind of bolster what Paul's saying here. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you or I'm absent, I may hear that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. What does he say? Now you're like, well, I could never walk worthy of the gospel. That's why it's grace and mercy. I mean, I need his mercy and grace. I can never be good enough to be consistent with the gospel or the grace. I can't earn that. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here is, is that we are walking in a, in a way that's consistent with what we believe. And where it's inconsistent, we, we right the ship. So let, let, imagine you're driving down the road, trying to loosen your load. All right. If you're married, you only got one woman on your mind. All right. That is just, oh, sorry. Sorry for that. Okay, here we go. All right. So imagine you're driving down the road, and you got a bad alignment on your vehicle. So when, you, um, when, when, when you're driving and you let off the wheel, the the, the tires cause your vehicle to pull to the left, you know? So in, in a moment, you're like, whoa, or maybe they cause you to pull to the right. We're not making political statements here. All right, we're just saying, all right, you, you're, it's misaligned. You're supposed to be going straight, which maybe that is a statement. But anyway, all right, you're supposed to be going straight, but you could divert to the right or the left, and so you've got to be very careful. You let the hands, what do you need to do, right? What happens if your vehicle does swerve to the right or left? It's not like you go, oh, I can't believe I did that. You just straighten the vehicle up. Right? You get the vehicle straight, right? So in your walk with the Lord, imagine this, all right? You might have swerved to the right or the left. You might have violated God's word. There might be some things inconsistent. So what do you do? You get those right with the Lord and ask him to straighten you out and you, and you move on. You go forward, right? So walking worth, in a manner worthy doesn't mean that you've got to be perfect, right? But we are, we're aiming and we're striving towards the holy character of God. Now, notice what he says. Walk in a manner worthy of him who calls you. What an incredible statement. It wasn't, it wasn't you or I that said, I am, I'm, I'm in. I'm ready to go for this thing called Christianity. I, wanna, I want in. I'm, I'm ready to, to get saved. 
It wasn't us that made that initiative. It was God who called you. Think about that. How humbling is that? The Bible says when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We love him because he first loved us. He set his love and his affection on us. Think of how humbling that is. It wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't me that had the decisive action of faith. That It was that God called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. He summoned me. And by his power, he, he provided the means necessary for me to come to faith to him. He made the initiative, and he brought me out of my sin and slavery. Notice what it says. He calls you into his kingdom. So now he's reminding us, why would we walk worthy? Why would we, why would we even be concerned with how we live? Why did Paul make these measures to urge people to walk in a manner like this or to call them in this way? Well, it's because he called us into his own kingdom. The Bible says we were in, this is Colossians, we were in the domain of darkness. Isn't that a, isn't that a phrase that just grabs you? Like, all of us are living in one kingdom or another. We're either in the kingdom of light, God's kingdom, kingdom of heaven, sometimes referred to in Matthew, or we're in the domain or the kingdom of darkness. I mean, there's, there is no other way. We, either God is our father or as Jesus said, we're sons of the evil one. See, but we see here that we're to walk in a manner worthy because he's called us into his kingdom. He's made us heavenly kingdom citizens, even while walking on earthly sod. That's remarkable. And not only that, he's called us into his own glory. <clears throat> we're not speaking merely of a futuristic thing when we're going to glory in heaven. That is true. It will be glory for me, right? <laughs> but more than that, we're, he were called into his glory, meaning into his presence and his kingdom to be enjoyed and experienced even now. There is a kingdom to come and his will to be done, but now we are, by his death and resurrection, a part of the kingdom of God, and we are called into that. So clearly, these are not the kinds of actions that someone who's just in it for the money or someone who's just in it to do a job is interested in doing this kind of thing coming alongside of someone and and exhorting them coming alongside and encouraging them listening and being there consistently urging them to walk in a manner worthy when there's inconsistency with the word of God coming alongside and urging them towards consistency with you've strayed off the path let me encourage you to right the ship to pull the steering wheel to get right with the Lord that is hard work, and it's uncomfortable, and it's awkward. This requires getting into people's lives, spending time with them, listening to their difficulties, taking time to hear the real issues. This involves speaking the truth when people don't always want to hear it, but being willing to do that and believing <clears throat> that over time, <laughs> believing that over time, God's word will have its effectual work in someone's life, even if the conversation is uncomfortable. And we should, when we come to someone urging them to get back to the truth of God's word, we should always do it with grace. The Bible says, let your, let your speech always be seasoned with grace so that you may know how to answer every man. So it should always be with grace. It should be with truth and love, right? Speaking the truth in love, he says. Not compromising either one of those, truth or love. And this is what it takes. Believers, we're encouraged and called to do this. And this is certainly what it should be like for those who are spiritual leaders. In homes, fathers doing this, grandfathers doing this, mothers doing this, grandmothers doing this, friends doing this, coming alongside. Let me ask you this. If you had a friend and uh, they saw you uh, driving in an erratic manner, in a dangerous way. In other words, you weren't just swerving to the right or left. You were like, you were like jerking the vehicle over right in front of a UPS truck coming at full speed, which, by the way, in high school, I foolishly did. All right, but that's, a, that's another. Like, what kind of friend would you? Yeah, I know, I know. Just don't, we won't go there, right? Like, stupid, right? Like, you can just go, Pastor, that was stupid, all right? And you would be correct, right? Why would you do that, right? But you have a friend there who says, what are you doing? Get back where you're supposed to be, right? Why? Would that be a bad friend who actually corrected you? Would that be a bad friend? Or is the bad friend the one who goes, oh man, you know, I don't want to, that's your business, that's your stuff, I don't, you know, I don't want you to, I mean, okay, what if that friend's on the side of the road, not in the car with you, it doesn't have a self-interest involved, he's not in the vehicle, he's not going to get in a wreck. 
and he sees you over there, and your windows roll down so that you can, you can hear him, and he sees you running in front of that UPS truck. Is the bad friend like, ooh, I bet that's going to be a bad decision. That's not going to go well for him. I don't think it's going to go well. Right? Is that a good friend or a bad friend? Like, it's the bad friend who doesn't say anything, who lets that person go into impending danger without warning. The loving friend says, hey, pull back. Get back on course. Here's what I'm saying. Believers, there are times in your life you're going to have to go to your sons, your daughters, your friends, your coworkers who call themselves believers, people within the body of Christ you fellowship with, family and friends. You're going to have to go after them and you're going to have to bring the word of God to them and they may or may not receive it as truth. They may or may not perceive it as love or as grace. But you do so in the name of the Lord with a gracious attitude, asking for the filling of the Holy Spirit to direct you. And you go and do that because that's what love does. Paul is saying, we did that. Like a, like a loving father, we went after you and we pulled you back to the truth. It would have been easier just to take your money, <laughs> not confront you, not get into awkward situations, let you think and believe and act however you want. Life would be so much easier. But that's not faithful. It's not faithful to the gospel message and it's not faithful, faithful to the gospel mission. May we be those as believers who in grace and love and in truth are faithful to both the gospel message and mission. You bow your heads with me for just a moment. Believer, you've been uh, encouraged today not just to look to the example of those who would minister to you in the word, but to be those who, who take this example and, and do that ministering of the word yourselves in people's lives. In other words, just to be very clear, um, I would encourage you not just to think, well, this is a good checklist to think of if we ever have to find another pastor or if I want to know who to listen to on the radio or what books to read, what podcasts to listen to. That's certainly a part of the discernment process. I do hope that this has somehow sunk in real deep there. But more than that, would, would we be those who live <clears throat> with godly character? Will you be one who lives consistent with and true to the message of Christ, not just in, not just in what you say you believe, but, but faithful to it? Listen, I know that's going to require something more than you or I have to give. <laughs> I know none of us have the ability to faithfully, consistently live out this gospel message except that God gives us the grace to do so. So that's why we have to be daily reliant on him, getting into his word, reading, praying, fellowshipping with one another, getting with other believers throughout the week to sharpen each other's iron in Christ, not isolating ourselves. With that being said, then, would you, would you pray this? Lord Jesus, help me, give me grace to live faithfully and consistently this message so that the world around me can see God, help me to even have my mind and heart open to the world around me that desperately needs you. And then may I be one who would be faithful to encourage, exhort, encourage, and challenge. Uh, may, may you give me wisdom in how to do that and, and consistent in doing that in, in a way that is with the Spirit of Christ. Instruct me, Lord, in the faith through your word and through your Holy Spirit who abides in me. If this is your prayer, would you just join me in saying amen? If you're here this morning and you need some time to interact with God, we're going to sing this song uh, as we uh, come toward a conclusion here in the service. And I would encourage you just to use this as a time of prayer. Maybe there's something God has clearly <clears throat> made known to you that isn't consistent. You're like, well, I don't, I don't line up with being blameless or uh, holy or or devout in, in that way. I haven't really been dedicated or yielded to God. I've been holding out or holding back. There's some holiness uh, that's really lacking in my life, and I, I, there's sin I need to confess. Would you confess that? The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you'll confess that to him. I would encourage you during this time to do just that. Invite him to take control as Lord of your life uh, and to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Will you stand with me at this time? We're going to sing. As we sing, let's uh, bless the Lord and communicate with him in these moments.
couple of quick announcements. But first, um, thank you, Pastor Kevin, for bringing that word to us. Um, continuing the gospel breakthrough. Some of these topics are, are hard because it confronts things in our lives that are really tough for some of us to, we go home and we think about it and um, God convicts us. And I know that's, that's a lot to, to have through that. So thank you for bringing that, that message to us this morning. Um, so a couple quick things. Contribution records are done and they are at the back. Um, but you'll notice there are not a lot of them because if you have your email, then you should have already gotten a copy to your email. And I know several people have already let me know that they got it. They, they came through just fine. So um, if you do not see an envelope with your name at the back table, then you might want to look at the list that I have of email addresses and names. And if you would prefer a copy printed out next week, then highlight your name, and I'll get that done this week. Um, and also, if you're like, I, an emailed copy would be fine, and there is a printed copy, then put your email address on the sheet next to it so that I can put that in. And next year, you'll just get an email versus having that paper copy. So it's whatever you prefer, but um, they're at the back table, and um, just let me know and fill that out for me. Um, this is the last Sunday for the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering. So we're going to send off our check this week. Our total at the moment is $5,852. So that's amazing. Praise God that we got above our $5,000 goal. So if any anybody wants to um, to donate extra today, then that'll go towards a final, final number. And I'll give that to you guys next week what our final number is. Um, Youth Last Wednesday is this week, so we will be meeting here at the church at 6. We're going to play some games. Um, we're going to hang out. We're going to eat some food. We're just going to celebrate and enjoy um, hanging out with each other. So that's going to be 6 to 7.30. Bring your friends. This is a great opportunity. If you've been having a friend that's wanted to bring to youth group but you're not really sure, um, it, this would be a great time for them to just come hang out and meet us. So bring your friends. And then another really cool announcement, you've probably seen it in the email and on the slides going through, is that we get to do Masters Parking again this year. So very excited because the Nationals having patrons, so we will get to host uh, Masters Parking. And so what we will need is all of our students to be here if possible. I know some people go, um, they travel, and that's I, I totally get that. But if you are in town and want to give up some sleep to earn money towards camp, then Masters Parking um, is going to be starting. We'll start at 645 in the morning. The lot will open at 7. We will also need adult volunteers to help um, to be here to kind of help facilitate and uh, be at the front. We usually have people giving donations. We like to have an adult up front and out in the parking lot too. So uh, please let me know if you can help out with that and we'll start planning because it's going to be upon us as you know, re really quickly. Um, so that, please let me know if you can help with that. And the last thing is um, thank you for everybody that's been, been coming and giving to the blessing box. Dennis uh, and some others have been keeping me updated as well. First of all, I've seen lots of things have been donated to keep that blessing box stocked, and I've been told that it, it is being used, that people have found out that that's a great opportunity for them to get some canned goods and things um, that need it. So um, continue to bring those canned goods or other items, non-perishables, things like that, that can go in there, or even things like like, like masks and hand sanitizers or like little, little bags and things. Those are great, too. So if you have any questions about it, Dennis would be the one to ask, and he's, he's got you. So that is all my announcements. And if I could get four uh, men who are able to lift, we've got two platforms out here remaining from the live nativity scene, and we just hadn't had uh, on the weekdays uh, enough uh, men. That we'd, so if, if right after the service uh, we could get four guys to help move those things in, I think that's less than a five-minute task. That would be great. Just go on down there, and what thy, thy hand findeth to do, do with all thy might. <laughs> all right. That would be great. Yeah, it's, it is heavy. All right, let me pray you out with a blessing here. If you're ready to receive that, uh, you can um, just open your heart for, for this. And some of you, you're like, yes, this is what I needed today. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit.